Shares for beginners. My nephew is 12 and I was back in, uh, back in New Zealand and he New Zealand was doing a capital raise and uh, he turned to me and said, I've got in New Zealand and my shares he's thinking, will, will this impact, you know, will my shares be diluted? He's 12, he's talking about share <laughs> dilution. Like, he understands compound returns and compound interest. Like, I've been in the industry for 25 years, I still don't believe it, it's, but it's magic and, you know, returns will compound and that's a massive game that you're making returns on returns. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. What's going on in markets at the moment? Does anyone have any idea? Are you looking at coal or lithium as the energy source of the past, present and or future? Here to explain everything is Brendan Doggett. Hello, Brendan. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Brendan Doggett is the country manager of Sharesies AU, which is a brokerage. We can call it a brokerage. Yeah, that's the yeah, best sure. way, the yeah. description. The Sharesies platform has over 550,000 investors across New Zealand and Australia who have collectively invested nearly $2 billion Australian. So we were just chatting before we hit the record button, but um, you're from Wellington, New Zealand, when we were just uh, talking about what a great little startup fintech hub New Zealand and Wellington especially is. Yeah, so so born in Wellington, came over here in 2000. Um, yeah, Sharesies is a Wellington-based firm. Lots of great fintechs in New Zealand, lots of good SaaS companies. Like the Kiwi yeah. ingenuity is really, really strong. Mm-hmm. And I think the community in Wellington particularly is very supportive of each other. So you have founders helping out other founders and um, people who made some money maybe in early when they set up and got into zero early and reinvesting that in startups. So it's a really kind of nurturing culture, I think, that Wellington's maybe got. Maybe it's something to do with the shakiness and the, and the windiness of the city. Oh yeah, you have well. to be tough and tough in New Zealand, and you know, good old Kiwi ingenuity. Yeah, I, I was really disappointed when I was. We were in Wellington. Um, we were in that restaurant with the swinging chandelier. Oh yeah, yeah. And it wasn't swinging the day that we. <laughs> it's we were probably there. one of the only days it didn't. <laughs> So tell us about your background in finance. Sure. So yeah, born, born and raised in Wellington, went to university there, um, started at Ernst & Young, um, decided to head for London, but ended up in Sydney when the Olympics were on and thought, wow, this is beaches, weather, <laughs> um, parties, jobs, finance. It was all kind of perfect. So didn't get to London and then went to work at the Stock Exchange and, and kind of went through the houses, Macquarie and Citibank and, and Westpac, mainly in compliance roles early in my career and legal roles. So really got to see um, the impact of good or bad decisions on customers in the financial services industry. And then um, the job at Sharesies came up, you know, I was at Westpac for seven and a half years, ready for a change. Um, Good Kiwi company, great brand affinity in New Zealand. My nephew, uh, it's the only job that he's ever been impressed that I have at Sharesies because he knows it. He's in Wellington. And then um, got the job, spec through, and uh, two of the co-founders happened to walk past my house in Darlinghurst, which was a very weird coincidence. So it was like, this is fate. I've got to get this job. And I'm lucky (laughs) enough to actually have got it. Let's talk about compliance. And um, because that wasn't really the point of the interview, but we did start raving again before we hit the record button. Compliance seems to be, I don't know, it feels from the outside looking in for someone who's not from a finance background like myself, that all these rules are set up, obviously, to protect people, but it's also not helping people find good financial advice. That's right. So I was at Macquarie um, Equities just before the GFC and after the GFC. Um, and compliance compliance is very important. The outcomes for compliance are good outcomes for customers. So their money is protected. They're getting advice which is in their best interest. And we should just define here compliance or all the regulations. That yeah, regulations. So around you know, the industry. Um, yeah. ASIC would be the, the you know the biggest regulator with um, regulations in relation to advice and the financial services industry that impacts us. And it's all around good customer outcomes, which no one would disagree with. That's like that's awesome. Money it comes from a good place. Yeah, doesn't it? and yeah. money. People work hard for their money. They want to know it's secure. They want to know someone's not just giving them dodgy advice for the advisor's best and self-interest and but it's been going for a long time it's very complex the corporations act is massive the regulatory guides are incomprehensible sometimes uh, people are worried there's lots of things that can go wrong sometimes for by the advisor or just the market so there's a lot of risk in that and that creates a lot of complexity so you've got your um, people on the street you know getting advice and investing well is important but at the moment with the complexity of regulation and and how the industry is going either advice is very expensive or so general that it's not helpful and people just don't know where to go um so it, it is it's a bit of a, it's a real gap you can't get good quality 
affordable advice at the moment. We, we append all of our episodes by saying, you know, consult a financial advisor. Mm. But then a financial advisor is not someone who's uh, accessible to most people, especially if you don't have a lot of money. Yeah, so, and well, where, where do you even find them these do, days? That's um, right. Yeah, you know, where people do you find are leaving them? the industry. Where, yeah. Like, where do you, do you Google them? What You know, it's hard to, hard to even find, you know, do you have to go into an office? Do you fill out some forms? Do you need $200,000? Do you need, like, it's, there's so many barriers to that. And, and it's also like you can't even make a phone call and ask them a simple question. You know, because suddenly you've got to be given the whole five thousand dollar statement of advice. Yeah, because there's so much risk in it, and, and a good advisor will not just give you a little bit of advice because they want to know your, you know, your your goals, your investment horizon, what debts you have, how you're insured, what your family situation is like, how much you owe on your mortgage. That, that's a big conversation. So they're very yeah. um, reticent to to give that advice for for good reasons. But people just need a bit of help. And isn't uh, there a, an inquiry going on at the moment? Is it the Levy inquiry? Yeah, this um, looks to be some changes to to the advice um, compliance structure. Mm. There is a best interest duty, which is kind of like you have to look everywhere and make sure the advice you're giving is in the best interest of the client and there's no better advice anywhere. That's massive, right? And that's... yeah. You know, it's not well defined, so people are a bit worried about that by giving advice. So, so some of that seems to be that that will be un- unwound a little bit, which might mean that advice is, is easier to get. But again, there's lots of compliance around that, so so we'll see what happens. And many people, especially younger folk now, are going online and YouTube videos and podcasts and TikTok and Instagram and all sorts of places to get financial advice. What yeah, are your thoughts about that. Well, it's like I think there's some great, um, you know, she's on the money. Uh, your podcast. There's lots of great podcasts of people who really care about what they're doing and making sure people understand the markets and, and all the different types of investments and ways to do that. But it's hard to tell who's good, who's bad, who's self-interested. Um, you know, ASIC has put out some guidance in relation to influencers, um, which means lots of people aren't talking about financial matters anymore, which is and leaves a big gap in the market. And then there's other areas like, say, crypto, which are less regulated, um, that that you know are kind of going into that gap and that might be a bad outcome for some people because really when you're starting out when you're younger you should work out a budget you should pay down your high interest debt you should have an emergency fund it's and then you should stuff, look at investing yeah. yeah and who's gonna who's gonna pay for that advice or who's going to charge for that advice like that's not needed they're, you know they're great concepts and that's the basis when you know 20 30 before you get a mortgage or something that's all you really need mm. So we can't talk about that specky gold miner that we were planning to? <laughs> to <laughs> well, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to sharesies. Let's look at some of the sharesies investor trends. This interview came off the back of um, your August newsletter, mm. which you can talk about the data that you see from people investing using sharesies and what they're buying and selling. So we're looking at energy-related stocks and coal and lithium, which mm. seem to be um, talking about two different forces acting at the same time. Exactly. It's super interesting because if you mm. look at coal, two years ago, coal was being phased out. You know, we were, yeah. we were closing down on the coal-fired... Um, Stranded asset. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And like, what, what was going to happen? And people were really worried about that. Yeah. I think with the energy crisis overseas, Ru- the Russia-Ukrainian conflict continuing, um, people are looking at Australian, like digging coal out of the ground in Australia, which is great for us. So we've got lots of resources. But with these coal mines and the coal price is high, so they're making, you know, quite good money out of that. So, but where are the profits going to go? They're not going to invest it into more coal infrastructure because in two years' time, they're going much more to renewables and and whatnot. So the the idea is that they're making great profit, but that money's going to have to go somewhere and it may be returned to shareholders through dividends or, or whatnot. So that increases the kind of price, probably a shortish term play, I would say. Mm. And then if we look at lithium, lithium is obviously a very important metal for, for battery storage, for EVs. And it's also kind of linked quite closely to the tech story. So tech companies like Tesla, um, you know, big big EV providers. So that's kind of seen as the you know the future of energy, um, and we're lucky enough to have lots of lithium in this country as well. So it's but yeah, weird kind of that they're they're both coming at the same time. But the world has been a bit weird for two years, so you know, there's lots, <laughs> <laughs> lots to surprise. Oh, I'd say for two millennia. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, it's always weird. Uh, I th- and this is something I, I go on a little bit about is that um, both coal and lithium are actual commodities. Mm, yeah, and. 
I, I think people hear the story, they always hear the lithium story or they, they hear the coal story without actually thinking about what a commodity is. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah, and com- mm. commodities are interchangeable, right? So you yeah. have lots of different mining companies pulling the same metal out of the ground. It's the same metal. It's potentially not scarce. Um, you know, w- what does that mean? So the prices can fluctuate. As we see with the lithium miners particularly, the prices go up and down. Mm. You know, it's a little bit like um, Afterpay used to be. It was quite quite a volatile stock lithium's the same and i think tied to the tech company thing that also gives a bit of volatility because tech companies by their very nature are forward focused and profit and they're taking a punt now but the same with minerals you know it's like are we going to find that is it going to be a big deposit you know there's lots at play which keep that volatility going but with lithium there is absolutely a need for it and all the kind of electronics ev battery storage so there is kind Mm. of a demand there um but yeah, it's a commodity and interchangeable. It is, it is. And um, I, I think over the last week, and we're recording on September 15, just to date to stamp this, is Elon Musk has been trying to secure lithium supplies for Tesla, hasn't he? Yeah, and Tesla, like Elon is Tesla. And yeah. I think, you know, he, he tweets, we see what he does, he and makes and he can move markets with what he's doing. And, uh, you know, Tesla is delivering vehicles, is continuing to innovate and... Um, need lithium for those batteries and as more car manufacturers move to ev there's going to be greater demand for that and i think with the geopolitical stuff in europe that impacts you know where where the world will get lithium from too and other components for those things yeah so i think that's still like a you know there's a decent growth story in those companies and those the mining companies and the um the companies which use those minerals and of course amongst your uh, users is that the best way to use them? Users and um, clients. Well, yeah, we call them investors. Investors, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Amongst uh, shares is investors. Tesla remains one of the the big stocks, doesn't it? Yeah, and U- U.S. Tesla is always up. Mm-hmm. If it's not number one, it's number two or three, and on both buy and sell sides because of the volatility. But also, our investors are really interested in holding companies which they know they you mm. know they believe the fundamentals of the company the products are ones that they can see themselves using the management team is you know interesting stable visionary um and tesla's got that and it's a bit of fun you know yeah tesla everyone wants to talk about tesla or what elon's done or you know the up and down so it's kind of good water cooler dinner party conversation as well and he's he's quite a, a character, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, you know he's all over TikTok. He talks mm-hmm. about lots of different things. You know, he's really when you look at it, like rockets, cars, trucks, hyperloops. I mean, when you look at the rockets, I mean, uh, SpaceX, I think, are the largest deliverers of payload mm. in the world now. It's not NASA anymore. Or I know. The Russians, it's it's SpaceX. And you look up at the sky and you see lights going across and and, and yeah. a line. It's like, what's that? Well, that's Elon's low orbit satellites delivering internet to to the world. It's like, who would have thought? Yeah, and, and we're kind of a bit sanguine about it, aren't we? It's just like, oh, it's just it's just Elon being Elon. But yeah. it's pretty incredible what he's achieved. It's incredible. I don't know. Like, does he sleep? I don't. <laughs> I don't think he does. He obviously doesn't work out like all the other tech billionaires. Yeah, though. that's right. <laughs> he uh, he got a bit of feedback on that. I think he's gone on a bit of a diet. So there's been a rotation out of individual stocks to ETFs. What What is the nature of that um, rotation? Yeah, what, what we see when the market is uh, continuing to be volatility. So the last eight months have been particularly volatile after quite a good bull market. So mm. people were investing, market was going up. They'd buy you know, five companies and some ETFs. When the market keeps being volatile, some of the lessons I think of the last eight months have been when you're concentrated in companies, they can go up and down, and that's not a that's not a comfortable place to be looking when your portfolio might be in the red in times like this. And so we see a return to more Australian blue chips or companies which can pass on inflation, like you know West Farmers, Coles, Woolies, whatnot. But then also ETFs give that diversification. So you think, oh well, you know my one company's gone down, and that impacts my portfolio. Whereas an ETF, a well constructed ETF across the ASX or the US or the world gives that diversification, someone else has done that for you, it automatically kind of rebalances, it's a good place to park your cash. And then particularly if you look back at the 10 years of the market, you know, all things being equal, the markets are probably going to keep rising. And the return for the last 10 years is around about 9% if you reinvest dividends. 
So that's kind of a, that's quite a good return. Pop your money in there and just kind of keep investing. And lots of our investors have done that. And they just are doing auto invest weekly, putting some money in, just continuing to do that. And ETFs are super popular when there's a bit of uncertainty. Is that something about the learning process is that people go in gung ho into the markets and they think, oh, I love all these companies and they're all going up, you know, and you go through that period. But that's when the real learning comes is when there's a bear market like we're going through now or a bearish depends on your point of view yeah. really isn't it <laughs> yeah and that's um lots of our investors are new to investing so when the market starts do you have data, do you have data on that that they are actually very yeah very yeah new? so yeah. um lots of our investors so we've got over six hundred thousand now in australia and new zealand um we survey them they're not trading through anyone else they've been new to investing or mm. and it's like their first couple of years um which is great and then we think well the market's just being a bit choppy at the moment how do you feel about that and so our investors are telling us actually their risk profile hasn't changed in fact they're more bullish about buying they understand the market cycles And in fact, you know, some of those companies they've been watching feel a little bit cheap at the moment, potentially. The products are still there, there's still demand, but they realize that the market price of that company is impacted by lots of things not to do with the company. Mm. And they learn through, you know, podcasts, um, great blog content, talking to each other, and they they get that, you know, the market's in downturn, dollar cost averaging is super boring, but super popular and a really good way to invest through the market's ups and downs and when the market's down dollar cost averaging is even better because the markets all things being equal will will kind of keep continuing to rise i'm so heartened by all this because i hear this from so many people is that um you know learning these skills and learning about dollar cost averaging and learning about diversification Mm. are just like become have become basic lessons whereas you know even just 10 years ago there was no information very very little information about this wasn't there yeah and my um uh, my nephew is 12 and i was back in uh, back in new zealand and in new zealand was doing a capital raise and uh, he turned to me and said i've got in New Zealand and my shares this thing will, will this impact you know will my shares be diluted he's 12 he's talking about share <laughs> dilution like he understands compound returns and compound interest like I've been in the industry for 25 years I still don't believe it it's but it's magic and you know returns will compound and that's a massive gain that you're making returns on returns yeah. So there's all these concepts that people are naturally through investing. And on shares, you can buy, you know, we fractionalize the market, so you can buy one cent of a share. So you can play around, test it out, learn without feeling like you're going to lose 200, 300 bucks at, at a time, which people learn through doing mm. and not being talked down to. So lots of our content is jargon free. We try and talk about, you know, what's diversification? We've got great brand assets and the pineapple and fruit. So we can talk about, you know, diversification is having a fruit bowl and, you know, the different companies in there that spreads the risk um, and people just pick these concepts up. And for too long, the industry has had so many walls to getting in, like jargon, you know, you mm. make, make customers feel stupid so, you, so that they have to come to you for advice. Like, it's just a different world now. So goodbye, Netflix. Hello, Disney. Yeah, Netflix seems to be losing subscribers. And I don't know about you, but um, I've got all the streaming services and Netflix doesn't seem to you know, grab my attention anymore. And I think that's happening around the world. You know, they're dropping millions of subscribers and coming up with new ways to create revenue with an ad thing. But people are saying, well, Disney's been around for a long time. Disney's already worked out how to monetize their content. They've got such a massive library that they just seem library. yeah it's, it's and unbelievable they're, they're using it? Yeah. it really well they've got access to sports and it seems to be you know the thing and those streaming services there is a lot of them and you've got to think there'll be consolidation but disney has like got that brand got the content got the the financial might behind them and they're just adding subscribers so people are kind of flocking to that more now and they were a f- complete failure disney i was just reading about the history of disney the other day and um i think during the the 30s till the 40s that they they were just losing money hand over fist. They were like a like a startup, really. Yeah, and, and it's like um, yeah, and I think it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs suddenly paid for everything and um, built the expansion that they went forward on. Yeah, it's great. Mm. The history of Disney is, is awesome to look at. From a, it's you know, it's almost like Richard Branson and Virgin, like, mm. but it's played out again. And and those are the companies that you want to know the story, research, do your due diligence on, and believe in and you know imagine if you got into disney shares you know 30 40 years ago and and held on to them and do you find investors are more interested in the u.s market than the aussie market 
definitely the US market is our second most. So lots of people in Australia know the companies, know the people, know the products. Uh, yeah. The US was very popular, particularly in tech names. So it's all the big, you know, Microsoft, Tesla, Apple, all the ones that you would expect. Um, and people like, oh yeah, I've bought shares in the US and that's another, you know, interesting thing and people feel good about. But those are the kind of products that people use here, iPhones and you know, everyone knows Windows and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Facebook. You know, Colgate, yeah, and, and it's Johnson all, and Johnson, yeah, so many, it's all brands so many that people companies, know. yeah, yeah. And what are the most popular ETFs? So, yeah, ETFs that four of the top five ETFs at the moment have an ESG aspect to them mm. in Australia, and I think twenty percent of our funds under management and ETFs are in relation to ESG. Um, exposure through ETFs, which is really interesting, but also, I think, because of our customer base. Is it part of a reflection of the demographic? Yeah, I think so. 80% of our customer base are under 40 Mm -hmm. um, and really believe about putting their money where their beliefs are. And, you know, the environment's very strong, clean energy, but also ESG exposure. It's hard to kind of work out what social governance is in that Mm. ESG bit. So when you have fund managers who can package that up quite nicely, because people do believe about supporting companies which are trying to do better and trying to do good in the world. So that's, yeah, four of the top five. And then we have the ETFs which provide uh, diversified exposure to Australia, the US, and then um, the world, um, excluding the US. And those are the usual sorts of ETFs. Um, Thematic ETFs are great now that people can also then kind of focus in on battery tech or gaming or like there's so many ETFs out there. But yeah, people are still focused on on putting their money, make the world a better place, but also diversification across the major markets. And of course, the major markets, I mean, if we just look at an ASX 200 ETF, for example, there's the the top 200 stocks, obviously. But I always ask the question, do we really need to own all of the banks? And do we really need Mm. to own... I mean, do we really need to own Telstra? I mean, it's great for dividends, but, you know, the share price movement has been pathetic for many, many years. Yeah, and that's why you can find these ETFs which exclude some of the banks or just look for high growth companies or like there are so many ETFs out there managed by great people that give you all the detail of the underlying and say, yeah, because mm. do, do we need exposure to all the banks? It's like, but mm. you could just go ASX, you know, top 20, probably all the banks again. But there are there are ETFs which which you know, match your interests, match your values, and, and that's um that's really interesting and, and people do flock to those. And I think it's also always important as well to understand, to look under the hood of an ETF, and because if you own maybe three or four mm. um, broad market exposure ETFs in the Australian market, there's going to be so much correlation across that and people don't realise that. Yeah, that's right. So diversification kind of goes like if you have, you know, if you've got five Australian ETFs, the overlap's going to be pretty big, so you've got to mm. you've got to think about that. And again, like lots of blog content, the Money Smart um, website that ASIC does is really good about talking about. We love that. ASIC. Yeah, we love <laughs> ASIC. Um, that that website's really good. No jargon talks about how to invest in diversification as well. Obviously, we've got some great content on Cheesies about that as well. But yeah, you're right. It's like just because it's an ETF doesn't mean that some of those things might be the same. So you've got to got to think about that. And I've noticed there's a lot of educational material on sharesies as well. So um, a listener just starting out for the first time, where would you direct them? I mean, what's the first thing that they should learn? So go to sharesies.com.au and then we've got a learn section in there. And that talks about, you know, what is investing? What does it mean to be an investor? What should you think about? um, And kind of budgeting tools on as I kind of said before, you want to make sure that you're paying down your debt and you've got an emergency fund and then you want to start investing and really have a look at that. And then the best thing to do is just start. And because you can invest from one cent on Cheesies, you don't need to put a lot of money in there. You can put $5 in there and just start getting a feel for the market, how to, operate, how to put an order on. You can sign up really quickly, um, all digital, no forms, and then you can be trading within minutes and you can buy a share in a company you know watch it see how the share price goes start being interested in what's going on in the media about it you know learn more feel more confident start investing a little bit more you know get your etf so you have that diversification but then also have a look at a company that you like and you know if you're lithium's the future you know buy that or 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 some of the brands that you know supermarkets like there's so much opportunity but you don't need to spend a lot of money to do that and it's like get in there start a habit um, and just kind of build that over time. Yeah, a couple of guests have said, used terms, one is a learn by doing, mm. 
and just listen to the words because the words aren't going to make sense for a long time. Yeah, and you just you just get it. Like um, and it, it is it is learned by doing because then you're more confident. People start talking to you. The the thing about the growth in New Zealand, two billion dollars funds under management for the New Zealand platform. Eleven percent of the population in New Zealand trade on sharesies. Lots of people were never investors before. When the founders kicked off the idea they asked people hey if you had 50 bucks and you needed to do something with it by friday what would you do no one talked about investing and they said well you know if you wanted to invest and then what would you do now i don't know how to start 50 bucks isn't enough it, it would be scary i have to go into an office there'll be someone in a suit or i have to fill out some forms and they just wouldn't invest in it so i see that two billion dollars as money that pro- that may have never been invested Mm. And $2 billion can change lives. And, and people are sitting around at dinner talking about their invest with their kids. My family, we never spoke about investing. That's Dad, right, Dad yeah. was a cop. There was no extra money. Um, it really, until I came to Australia and started working at the stock exchange and stuff, I didn't know that, you, you know, this, how can you make income other than just your job? Like these things were never discussed. So you've got to start somewhere. And because you can, the barriers to entry are low now, give it a go. You know, everyone, some things will go up. Some will go down. You might make a mistake. That's okay. Everyone makes mistakes. You know, most people will just talk about, oh, I brought Afterpay at you know three dollars and made you know, a mozza. It's like people don't always tell you about the failures. Yeah, the failures, yeah, or yeah. you know, but everyone does it, and it's not. And if you're just investing a little bit of money, well diversified, you know, portfolio, all things being equal, will will go up. But there will be some ups and downs. What about the, there is a bit of a debate about um, platforms and some are on the chess sponsorship model mm. and others are on custodial, is it? Yeah, the, custodial hands. Yeah, and shares is, is custodial model. Uh, is there any disadvantage or advantages between the two? No, it's, Australia is very, it's an outlier in the world to do with the people holding their shares individually. So uh, it's a holder identification number. So on a chess statement, it's in your name legally. And, and that's that, when you get those paper statements yeah, all the time. thousands of paper you, statements <laughs> yeah. and like how do you, where do you find where they are and what do you do with them and like all that sort of stuff. And then back in the day, um, Wraps were invented in Australia, so Macquarie Wrap is a very popular one, BT Wrap, where all the assets in that financial ones were owned by one custodial nominee who does all your paperwork for all you, does your tax statements, manages all the admin of those, those shares, and that's what Sharesies is. And it used to be that you paid a premium for that model, and now you know with technology it's easy to do. It's no cost to do that. So we hold it in a custodial hand. But you still own your shares. You legally still own your shares, um, and the custody hand also enables us to fractionalise a share. So you kind of get the benefit of being able to buy a dollar of a te- uh, Tesla share rather than the whole share or or bits of ETFs. So there's lots of benefits in relation to ease of admin, consolidation of tax reporting. You still own your shares. We're still regulated. Your money's safe versus a, a hen model um like both are, both do the same thing but it's just you know what suits your purposes better really and, and what about the brokerage i mean if you're buying a dollar's worth yeah. of a company is it what's the brokerage super shooting? cheap so it's <laughs> like um 0.5 of a percent i oh, so there's no minimum amount. no minimum it's a, it's a yeah so if you buy one cent of a share we make a tiny bit of brokerage on that so what would you tell someone who is only got five dollars to invest i mean it really seems like a long way in the future to just start with five dollars but you've got to start somewhere and i think it's the habit and Mm. so we talk to people and people are really proud that they've invested their first dollar or five dollars because they're an investor now and that means a lot of things to people it changes the way you think about it changes psychology you start looking at the looking at the world in a different place you think about you know you're invested in a company you look at their products and you're like okay cool i can see that people really are interested in those products you, know, you read the papers more, you talk to your friends about it, you start investing more. Like regular investing habits are massive. The power of compounding returns is magic. Like, you know, you put $5 a week in it. Say, if my dad put $5 a week away for me every week from when I was born, I would have a lot more money in the bank than I do now. And lots of that is interest off interest or returns off returns, not the amount of money you've put in. But the habit is the best thing. And do you the, ever tell your dad that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> now, no. now I put money in his account. And he says, I'm grateful, kid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's like, yeah, the, the power of a habit. And yeah, $5 might not change the world for everyone, but that's a significant amount of money over time. Like, you know, it's time in the market, not timing the market. And that regularity of investing and just getting used to it and then putting it up to 50 bucks when you can afford it or $100 or it's like superannuation, right? So it's like just that power of time is um, super important. 
Okay, Brendan Doggett, thank you very much. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Actually, I just wanted to ask you to say I love hearing the word pathetic with a Kiwi accent. (laughs) (laughs) Pathetic. No, you've been in Australia too. (laughs) If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast.